Hello, everyone, and welcome with me today. I am chatting with Patrick Hogan and Anna Krista Johnson. Now, I've had an opportunity of talking with you guys several times over the years at FilmQuest and did a review of your last film, which was uh, Killing Time. If I, yes, Killing Time. Yes. And, act, and I saw your film, but did not review it, the one virtually from like almost like five years ago. So this is something we go way back, but if anybody hasn't heard yet about who this person is patrick hogan has a lot of credits but we're going to focus on what you've done recently with anna and that is your latest film quiet mom is working so as we get started why don't you go ahead and give your quick introductions of yourself and tell me what is your elevator pitch or your quick reference of what you say is quiet mom's working very good you Want me to go first or you go first? I'll go, you but go. mine will probably be shorter. So uh, Anna Krista Johnson and I star in Quiet Moms Working. Um, I also was a co-producer and I um, often play that role. I'm, I'm very good at project management. So I've been co-producer on Killing Time, as you mentioned, um, or an earlier project and also virtually. Um, so yeah, I do a lot of pr producing of Patrick's work. He is, uh, you know, a prolific writer and director. So it gives me an opportunity to work with him. And uh, I'm Patrick Hogan and I, uh, on, on Quiet Moms Working, I wrote it and directed it. I came up with the idea and the pitch was, um, it's, the pitch is, I mean, the, the, the log line is what happens in mom's basement stays in mom's basement. And it's, it's a comedy. And it's about a it's about a mom who is up to things in her basement, and uh, as often happens, I think any parent can relate to this. No matter what you're doing in your life, your kids don't care, and they will interrupt when they want to interrupt, and their problems are always more important than your problems. So, regardless of what mom's got going on in the basement, um, she's not going to get through it without her kids uh, interrupting in hopefully uh, comedic and hilarious ways. And I'm sure, you know, some of the idea for that came out of the pandemic when people were really, you know, suddenly found themselves working from home and found their kids studying or going to school from home. And the kind of impact that that had on families, you know, nationwide, worldwide. Um, and we saw how, how much, like when we intertwine our families and our work lives, um, yeah, some crazy things can happen so yeah this kind of makes light of of that aspect so but the, I, the, the other elevator pitches i always tell people when people ask me where the idea i said i was like what if dexter was you know my wife <laughs> and that, was, and that was that was now it goes in different it has a lot of twists and turns but that's kind of where it started um krista had produced the last couple short films but she's also an amazing actress. And so I wanted to come up with a concept that could feature her and let people see just how talented she is. And I thought, what better than have her in the basement maybe doing some dark and nefarious things? Just everyday life, right? Yeah. It's not it's not biographical in any way, shape, or form. I always purely fiction. I always tell people I had nothing to do with the concept. I didn't come up with it. I didn't co-write in any way, shape, or form. This is all like the twisted mind of P. Patrick Hogan. So I just showed up, you know, with my lines memorized. That's it. Although, uh, although our younger daughter, who's only a couple years older than the, the character in the film, after she uh, saw the film, she said, Dad, I feel attacked. <laughs> so it was quite... So the family was involved, it sounds like, to some levels, at least in reviewing it for you. What what are some of the other connections of people that you have in the film, uh, either be in front of the camera or behind the camera, that would be considered, you know, friends and family, and how that all ties in? Well, yeah, this was um, definitely a tight production. We did it in one weekend. We... Um, we specifically really wanted it to be something for Film Quest, um, but you know, obviously something many, many audiences can enjoy. Um, but we came up with the idea actually 
the year before while attending Film Quest. And as often happens at that particular film festival, lots of amazing um, talent, lots of creative people, and you make all these fabulous connections. And Patrick had uh, watched a movie called Breathing Happy, um, which was, I believe, written, directed, and starred Shane Brady. Yep. And we got in this amazing conversation with him. And just, you know, when you meet a kindred spirit or someone you really connect with who is also that talented, you want to work with them. So, Patrick, um, you want to take it over? To yeah, kinda... so I, I basically, you know, I knew that mom was going to be down there with, you know, I don't want to say the word victim, but there was going to be another person in the basement with mom. And uh, um, I thought Shane would be perfect for that. So um, he said he would read the script once I finished it. So I wrote it with 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 those two actors in mind from the get go. So they were the roles were written tailored specifically to kind of lean into, you know, what uh, what I say, Krista, Anna Krista, and Shane uh, could bring uh, to it. And then even when we got past that, um, the product the um, production designer was um the uh danny who's amazing who did the production design on virtually uh the film from many years ago at film quest and in fact shane then hired her after the short film and she is the production designer on his new feature film that he's in the middle of filming right now um which i love i love it when you know you can kind of connect artists together and, and they click and they get it and the same thing happened with the set designer was um who worked with danny was uh, a kid who grew up with our kids. We're friends with um, uh, his mother and we've known him since he was, you know, probably eight or 10 years old. And uh, he got into uh, set design and, and, and special effects makeup design. And um, he, he like turned our garage into that basement set. That was his work uh, creating that. So it was, a, it was a, it, you know, and then the actress uh, who plays the daughter, Jillian, was someone who's worked with Shane. He does these uh, acting workshops in LA uh, for kid actors. And she had grown up going to his workshops and he was the first person that he recommended to me. So it was kind of like all connections and it was friends or people we've worked with or you know, family, it was that kind of, uh, of a shoot. Our stunt coordinator even was a, you know, referral from somebody that you knew that you have yeah. worked with, a referral of a referral yeah. um, from, the stunt coordinator on, yeah, yeah. on another show you work on. Yeah, I do I do the sound for a show called Cobra Kai on Netflix. And so I called up uh I didn't call I emailed Don, the stunt supervisor, stunt coordinator on the show. So I have I have a little advantage there. I was able to reach out to him and he connected me with someone who then connected me with someone uh which was Tecla and who was awesome. And again, once she came on board, we rewrote a couple things. Uh I don't want to give the spoiler away, mm -hmm. uh, uh but there's a particular skill she has that we specifically wrote into the film once she came on board. So even her role, every role was kind of tailored to that person. Okay, it was a lot of fun in the writing. I think there was some great foreshadowing that you know comes before the reveal of the twist that if you're watching it, it just is a great fulfilling aspect of the movie and if you're not catching them when that twist hit it, you could see it in the audience where people are just going oh my god yeah <laughs> you know, it just it just hit them so i give you a lot of credit for the writing that took place and acting it out because it was really a lot of fun now you were starting to say something anna and i when i started talking oh no just one of the things that happens when you're making these projects is yeah, you know, you have whatever you've written on the page and then and then as Patrick pointed out, some new things kind of develop as you're making the film. Um, one of the interesting um, things that Patrick mentioned was we did kind of um, create a basement out of our garage and we live in Southern California. We, there are a lot of earthquakes, so there are not a lot of basements actually in Southern California, but there's a happy accident that kind of came out of that, that decision um, to use our garage as a basement. And, um, you know, basements, one of the things about shooting in an actual basement is they don't have a lot of light and they have very low ceilings and we needed some kind of more um, 
you know, headroom for some of the shots we wanted to do. And so a happy accident that kind of came out of that choice to use our garage was that there was more headroom to do some of the things we wanted to do. And we had some flexibility <laughs> with a garage and without giving anything away. Remember, with a garage, one of your walls can just lift up and open up. And you can move your cameras outside of those four walls. So, um, yeah. you know, that was a happy accident that kind of came about during the process yeah. of creating, you know, this idea of like, well, what if we did use a garage as a basement? Yeah. In the second half of the film, and things get a little crazier, again, without spoiling the surprise for people, we we intentionally waited and we didn't film. We, we filmed everything else during the daytime. And then we filmed that particular sequence at night and as soon as it got dark because it was actually a garage we basically were able to lift one wall out of the way and now the camera and crew and stuff could move way further back and we can get much wider shots than we could have in any actual uh basement without having any some sort of like distorted fish eye type uh lens so it ended up being a lot of fun and i think that's one of the really great things about working on short films and um you know, kind of using what you have and, and looking at like, okay, this is what we're working with. How can we get really creative? And you do, you do have a lot of happy accidents that way. And I yeah. think short films, they give you the leeway, they give you the freedom to kind of play creatively. You know, you don't necessarily have that when you're dealing with a full feature and you're dealing with the budgets of a full feature, you know, it, it does, you are limited a little bit more. So I think that's one of the great things about working on short films. You gotta be creative. You can't pay your way out of uh, challenges. You gotta come up with fun, interesting ways to get out of them. Okay. So it sounds like this one really was a lot of fun for you guys to put together with the people you were working with. That's always, and it comes across in the film too, that there was a lot of fun happening, a lot of good chemistry. So you already mentioned like the happy accent of filming in a garage was what would you say without giving the, what was probably the hardest aspect though of keeping this together? I almost feel like it might be keeping everybody straight faced at the times that they're needed. But uh, what would you say was the hardest part of putting this together? Boy, for me, I think the, well, for me, the hardest part was, you know, in the end, I just went with what made me laugh. But when you're doing comedy, I think one of the hard things is you're operating kind of in a vacuum. You know, great thing about theater is you get to workshop a comedy and you get to have audiences see it and you can change things. You know, if they don't laugh at a line, you can you can change it. But, you know, we just had one week in the filming. It wasn't like we got to film it once and then we got to play it for audiences and then we got to go back and film it again. But now, like, fix all the things where they weren't laughing as much as we hoped they would. Right. You have to kind of trust that what you're doing is funny. And so if it made me laugh or it made someone on the crew laugh or whatever, then we're like, OK, great. That's what we're going to go with. So I think that that and just even though it was even though it was bigger than a basement, there was one point where the lighting we filmed one interchange between uh, Chris and Shane. We filmed it with two cameras. So we filmed it. It's what you're seeing is actually one take in real time, basically, which is great because it allowed to see the energy between them. But um, with all the lights and stuff, like I ended up getting trapped in a corner. <laughs> like, like, like we were just kind of the lights and stuff and the DP was tweaking things and I'm standing there and he's tweaking and tweaking and ready to roll. And I was like, well, I guess I'm going to have to call it from here. And I kind of like trained to see the monitor because I was basically pinned in between three lights and Krista had to do some maneuvering to do some movements she was supposed to do. And it was like, well try to not duck until you're out of the camera in that line of the camera, because I know you can't actually get all the way off screen because we've boxed you in. So there's some practical concerns as well. Uh, what about you? Well, as, as a performer, just the, you know, it's a fairly elaborate, some of the scenes are fairly elaborate and we did not have a lot of rehearsal time for those scenes. Yeah. So, you know, as I mentioned, we do have a stunt coordinator um, and that person came in day of and, we did, you know, some warming up and had about a half hour uh, to learn choreography and not a lot of time to practice it. Um, that that particularly, it's kind of done in three acts. So when you watch the film, you'll see 
that third act is is you know pretty packed that all had to be shot in one day and there was really not a lot of rehearsal time so um yeah luckily it it came off and we were able to pull it off but it was a challenge for sure no chris that was great because the way we did that is i mean they did a full rehearsal but then what we would do is we would film it with the stunt coordinator in first and that gave krista extra time to study what she was doing and the moves so we would do it with this we would film with the stunt coordinator and then the stunt coordinator would step out and then krista would um step in and i've had i've had a couple people who say that it wasn't until the point where it kind of really gets crazy uh but for the first two thirds of the fight they didn't even realize there was a stunt coordinator uh in there that that the, it was pretty seamless as far as uh, which also credit to our hair and makeup hannah who did an excellent job of making uh our stunt coordinator and krista match really really well and so i was really proud to hear this people it took a while for them to realize that there was even you know that that wasn't just krista doing all the moves herself i always joke thank thank goodness for uh gymnastics and that whole kickboxing craze in in the 90s because uh <laughs> that carried the day in 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 terms of uh being able to pull that scene off okay so i think we've kind of covered without giving anything away about the show so let me ask what's next for the you know quiet moms working is it, it's currently on film festivals so if somebody wants to see it where could they possibly get a chance to see this next or the next one well so we're waiting so uh we actually um our first couple of festivals that we applied to, um, the film wasn't even done yet. It was a work in progress. And we, we um, basically submitted to festivals who had programmed films from us prior. So they knew what the, like, basically went in to get that, you know, they, they could watch it, but they knew that the finished product would be of a certain level yeah. because the color hadn't been done. There was no sound done, you know, things like that. Um, and so that's the, in order to make a couple of deadlines, so now we're waiting to hear from a whole bunch of festivals for next year. We've, we've applied to festivals starting in, in um, uh, late February or early March. Because uh, festivals typically, there aren't a lot of festivals around the holidays for, for obvious reasons, right? People are, it's, you know, it's tough to, to have a festival the week before New Year's and expect filmmakers to be able to attend and audiences to come out and, and participate. So we're waiting to hear from a ton of festivals from like March all the way through August. Uh, everywhere from, from just down the street from where we live all the way to London. Um, uh, it did, it's already played at three festivals, which were the festivals that we applied to, uh, you know, previous to, to finishing it. Um, and then, you know, so we're hoping it'll play and we're hoping people will, you know, hope, you know, we'll wait, you know, you never know. The response so far has been great. So hopefully other festivals also you know enjoy this type of comedy that's a little bit edgy but but not as not as dark like it's a dark film but it's still kind of a sweet film um and uh and then you know then we'll probably get it you know like a lot of short films you want to get them out just for people to see so on youtube where we'll find some sort of uh a, we might even say oftentimes there's foreign um opportunities for short films because TV stations and other countries will play short films here, here in the U S there really isn't any market whatsoever for, for short films, but in other countries there is. And so uh, I have some relationships with the distributor in Europe that have distributed some of my other short films. So maybe we'll, we'll go out there and, you know, and the goal is to, to earn back a nickel on every dollar you spend. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna, short films are a great way to, to spend money. Um, I, I joke with people as being an artist of any type, you know, it's, being an artist in most forms, either it's film, writing, game design, painting. It's so what's your day job? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So that'll be the, that'll, so this is, this is, you know, Film Quest was basically its premiere. Um, it was the first time we saw it with an audience. And so far, the only time, because we weren't able to make the other two festivals that it's played at. So we're really hoping in 2024, we get to go see it with some audiences and, and um, travel around and go to some festivals and then, you know, and then it's right on to the next. I already have the next short film uh, ready to go. I just got to put pen to paper and, and get it written. But I know what it is and what we're going to do. And, and then maybe maybe we'll get crazy and we'll go back and jump into the world of features next and try to do something that actually could have some sort of 
commercial value and actually, you know, heaven forbid an artist make money, but you know, I'm willing to give it a shot. So you got me asking now, what can we expect to see? Next? Yeah. Um, well, the next film is going to be, uh, again, it's kind of like, I don't want to spoil it, but, um, you know, since I work, since my day job is sound, I came up with a great concept for a film that's centered around someone who's blind and not being just a black screen. You know, I don't want to just have, not, not that's, you know, not make radio, but a film told from the point of view of someone who's blind, who, where the sound is what's going to provide all the information to the audience. Um, which I don't think I've seen before. And I think something that maybe I'm uniquely suited to do as a filmmaker, uh, we would literally build, we would literally start and build the short film first as a radio play and build the sound first. And then we would film playing that back on set because instead of it being um, visuals that inform what happens to the actors, it's gonna be sound that informs what happens to the actors and it's genre. So there's something, there's a twist, of course. Um, should be fun. Uh, and then, and then, and then I have two feature films uh, that I'm hoping to get going. One, one is, has outside producers and it's actually not genre. It's a true story, uh, a drama about a woman who's from the island of Guam, which is where I'm from. So something that's kind of important and personal to me. And then if not, I have another uh, genre film um, that I'll, I'll do instead of that one doesn't take off as with most, with most the, uh, situations when you're a filmmaker especially or any kind of art you got to have many things going because you don't know which one's going to gain traction and go so you're kind of always juggling a couple things trying to see if someone gets interested in one of them whether it's money or a person or talent or something that gets attached to it that can kind of help get it made so that's that's what i'm doing okay how about you anna are you trying to wedge in on these other films or do you got some projects of your own that you're working on well, I'm, I will probably be co-producing uh, the short film that uh, we're working on. And in fact, I already have ideas. We, we, you know, we have the benefit of living very close to one another. So we talk a lot, um, even just over a meal over, oh, I had this idea, or what if we do it this way? So a lot of the creative process just happens very organically here. And, um, and then, yeah, I mean, performing in other projects. Uh, I'm also wrapping up a master's degree in transformative social change uh, that uh, that will be done at the end of December. And then going on to work on a PhD in that same field. So uh, yeah, staying busy. And acting, Caster, you have a, you have a role in a Christmas movie. Yeah. Cr Christmas movie coming out. You got to, I forget. Yes, uh, the 12 Games of Christmas. 12 Games of Christmas coming out, a holiday movie that you were in. Yep. It's totally different tone, I'm assuming, than... Yes, than absolutely, absolutely completely different. I, I have range, what can I say? Join your range. <laughs> I will say your, your education sounds interesting to me because my undergraduate degree is in sociology. Nice. Uh, excellent. So well, we will have an in-depth conversation about that next time we see each other. <laughs> Definitely. So let's kind of shift gears a little bit and kind of talk about what you guys do and how you got into this. Because um, if people don't know, Patrick has been nominated for a number of awards and has worked on some very major projects. You already mentioned Cobra Kai, but I mean, I think you're just kind of finishing up Reservation Dogs and there's Fire Country, um, and some they've got some older ones like the Umbrella Academy, a lot of different awards. But for both of you, why filmmaking? What got you interested? What was your motivation to follow this career path? I, I mean, I'm a storyteller at heart. And I also, I mean, I have written a book. I've, hmm. you know, the, so stories just fascinate me. Other people's stories, I love um, and maybe that's why the sociology degree, um, I think they are a way to um, step outside of ourselves, to look at um, social situations and also a way to connect with each other. So um, yeah, and to be moved and to um, be entertained, all of it. So I just, I've always loved stories. We actually met at Northwestern University where I was in the theater department. Um, and Patrick was radio, television, film major. So, 
Yeah. What about you? Yeah. Same thing. I mean, I used to write short stories when I was a kid. Um, I got it. Uh, I won an award when I was in third grade and they accused me of plagiarism. They said no third grader could write a story like this. And so they made me sit down and write another story while they watched <laughs> to prove that I hadn't. My mom was so upset that I hadn't um, stolen the idea uh, from someone else. Um, but then I saw Star Wars and that was it. I mean, that was it. The love of how movies take you into a different world you know when i was young like that it was star wars and sci-fi and then later on in life you know more uh you know themes of you know films like breaking away or the diving bell and the butterfly things that take you into emotional states that you can visit without having to live in them permanently or experience them in real life but filmmaking and and i'm kind of a you know a, a geek about you know tech and stuff and so I just kind of and for a while I loved acting in community theater but then I realized I wasn't a very good actor so it was kind of like I just kind of gradually the love of writing the love of tech the love of you know working with actors even if I don't get to actually act myself but just those kind of things all kind of steered me uh into film and I'm one of those um I've been doing it since I was 16 and uh um moved to LA to do it and then you know turns out i'm really really good at sound and fell you know didn't set out to get into sound but kind of fell into it because you know my love of, of filmmaking encompasses all the crafts you know uh most of my films i also am the picture editor because i for a long time i wanted to be a picture editor but i kind of fell into sound uh instead and it started paying my mortgage and so that made the decision for me pretty easily but just all facets of of filmmaking i love and it's a collaborative effort. You, you know, it's really hard to make a good film by yourself with absolutely nobody else, you know? So, I mean, I'm sure there's someone out there who has and, you know, good for them, but, but generally speaking, you need a lot of people uh, and you need to, you know, so you need that sense of um, community and that's, I've always been drawn to that. And uh, all these years later, I'm still doing it. So, and I want to, I want to mention that, um, you know, one of the kind of interesting and cool things that came out of the pandemic is that um, there's a lot more of sound editing and sound supervising that can be done, you know, from home now. So a lot, he has a home office and he's doing a lot of this work um, at home. And so I, I don't, he has headphones on, so I don't get to hear the show, but I do occasionally um, hear him like laughing you know, a lot of times you think when people are start start to work on stuff as your career that you lose that joy of being an audience member. And one of the things I love about Patrick is that he still has that joy of being, of watching um, and enjoying what he's working on. He's not only, um, you know, did he work on Cobra Kai, but he who's oh, he's always been a big fan of the show. He's a big fan of Reservation Dogs. And I just want to throw out there also that um, November 30th obliterated on the screen. And I literally heard him one time in his home office, you know, he's got headphones on. I have no idea what's going on other than the fact that he started laughing just out loud, really hard. And I, and I was like, I don't know what's going on in there, but that sounds like an amazing show. So he, he loves, he loves the medium, not just as, you know, a craftsperson and an artist to work on these projects, but also, as an audience member, he's delighted by other people's projects. And so, you know, I think that makes him really good at what he does. You know, he mentioned not being a very good actor, but I think the experience that he's had as an actor makes him a better director. And so all of these different facets of, of craft and art, you know, have for him come together and he gets to express all the different parts of it, you know, in his, small projects you know in the in the right. short films and personal stuff that he works on so i have done sound work just for the money don't get me wrong <laughs> a couple of, a couple of them were just paychecks well, but i've been really lucky to work on a lot of great shows too yeah. and those are the ones i love the ones where i'm a, like I said, i'm a fan as well as you know someone who gets to work on it well i can say you must be good at it because they keep bringing you back to great shows and like it's been pointed out you were you've been nominated for an enemy enemy yeah <laughs> nominated for an emmy 
10 times. So I'm yep. sure it's it's just knocking on the door there waiting to sit on your shelf. So January 6th is when they there's the next award show. So we'll see. That's for the 10th. We'll see. That's for reservation dogs. Yeah. Uh, we're in the same category with the bear. The bear is the bear of this coming award show. We'll see. It's a great show. It's tough. All the shows that are nominated are like phenomenal shows. So well, I mean yeah, we're go ahead. We're lucky enough that you know it happens to be a really good time to be in television. Um, you know, the projects are I just I feel like there's a lot of creativity in in TV and um yeah, and a lot of fun, fun stuff out there to watch and fun stuff out there to work on. So So I'm going to kind of wrap this up with just kind of one final question for each, since I get a lot of people like you've met them at, you know, Film Quest and other festivals. There's a lot of people just starting out, getting their first one going, or they're looking to want to get into the career. What would you recommend to someone if they came up to you and said, I am just starting, what should I do? <laughs> I Yeah, put together a great team. Find people. I mean, really, we don't, we don't do any of our projects um, without a lot of really great people. So Film Quest is a great example of a place you can go as a filmmaker and meet a lot of other filmmakers and watch their projects and see their sensibility, their artistic sensibility, their, their you know, ability, and you'll see it right up there on screen and you'll get to talk to those people make connections, find a great team of people. The um, the DP on uh, Quiet Moms Working was someone we yeah. met on a pre project we worked on earlier in the year. So um, it, you know, it was a connection we made working on another project. Go help out other filmmakers. If you don't have a lot of experience on set and you wanna get more um, experience on set, offer to be, a, you know, a PA on on a project for someone and you will learn a lot or if you know if you're you've never actually been a director and you want to shadow a director um, obviously that's someone who has more experience on a set not someone who's completely green <laughs> but you know that's your next step is oh I want that experience you make those connections offer to help other people out on on their films you will learn so much and you'll get a sense of um you know how it works and you'll also get a sense of like what you like and how you want to operate your set when the time comes to make your films um practice always writing i think any great project always starts with a, a you know a solid story you cannot if you don't have a good story you can't make a good film <laughs> it's really hard to save a bad script um so yeah and and watch a lot of stuff um make make those connections you can't do it alone yeah i mean that's the main thing i was going to say was that which is if you want to make your own film before you do it help other people on their films and learn from them and then steal all the good people that you meet to then work on your projects <laughs> um because because you know everybody says you know oh make films with your friends i was like well, well but are your are your friends any good at it right like like find make friends uh you know, and it'll happen on, it'll happen organically. If someone's talented and you're talented and, and, and you get each have interests in filmmaking and different parts of it, you'll kind of naturally start to talk to each other. And then those collaborations kind of tend, you know, naturally happen. Um, but a couple other, I mean, just on a practical standpoint, um, don't just write a script and then film it. Have people read it, have actors act it out. Um, preparation, preparation, preparation. You know, you may think the script is great, but if it's your first script, you probably don't really know and you're a little bit biased, you know, towards it. So vet it because when you when it comes time to shoot, however much time you have, it's going to go by so fast. Like you never have enough time. The more prep you do ahead of time, making sure the script's great, making sure you've blocked with the actors, making sure you've walked through the location, making sure you've come up with shot lists, the more prep you have, the more time you'll have on the day and you never have enough time. And so every minute of prep will save you two minutes um, on set. And then lastly, uh, the thing all beginning filmmakers um, do, don't skip on sound and production design. Those are the two things that are always lacking on 
beginner films and what make them look amateurish, or I should say sound amateurish as well, is not paying attention to sound and not paying attention to production design. You know, shooting at your in your apartment just because it's convenient is probably not the best look for the film. And definitely uh, not having the proper sound equipment um, and not having good sound uh, is the other thing. I always tell people, uh, if you don't have much money and you need to buy some equipment, the first thing I would actually buy is sound equipment because your iPhone can shoot better video uh, than what well, even five, what we had five years ago for low budget filmmaking, right? So if you have an iPhone, I would just use that and then buy sound gear because the iPhone has horrible sound and uh, um, start there. And then you can build, work your way up to a nicer camera and fancy lights and all this stuff. But honestly, if I only had a little bit of money to start with, I'd make sure I captured good sound on my film because when you're competing with other beginning filmmakers trying to get into festival slots, and your film has perfect sound, the programmers are gonna put your film at the top of that stack of first time filmmakers, I guarantee it. So that's a little other hint that I have for. Okay. And then the other thing I've had people ask me is outside of film, where do you find inspiration for the stories that and directing and anything you wanna to put together and do? What do you do to find inspiration? Um, I, I just look at what's going on in my own life. I mean, I, I think a lot of the things that, I mean, now, obviously Patrick does the writing in this team for our film making. And yeah, I would say there's always some way that he's modified it. He likes genre. He likes sci-fi. So he'll usually take an idea, but it's a, something that's essentially very human, very relatable, like quiet mom's working, you know, we can, families can relate to this idea of, you know, you're trying to get something done, you're focused over here, but your family needs your attention over there. That's a, that's a, just a very human experience. Now, has he taken it in a completely different direction? Yes. I don't, and that, that weird twisted part, I don't know where that comes from, but I can just say most of it is just, you know, in your own life, paying attention, being present, and noticing like those things that either frustrate you or make you laugh or, you know, that you want to highlight or that you want to bring attention to. Yeah. I mean, life, I think, you know, there's always that write what you know, I think you don't have to write what you know, you know, most of the scripts I've written, I don't know anything about dealing with bodies in a basement. You know, I promise I don't, <laughs> but, but, but what you're looking for when you're coming up with your ideas is through your own life experiences, what are universal truths or relatable things? Or oftentimes in stories, they'll say, you know, one of the things is look for archetypes, not stereotypes, right? So the archetype is, you know, a mom who's trying to do her work and is interrupted by her kids. That's, that's something that everybody can recognize, you know, and then the bad thing would be the stereotype would be, you know, typical things that you see in, you know, housewives. And we have something that's hopefully very unique and very different and you haven't seen before. Uh, and that's what makes it fresh and interesting and fun. But the, the arc, finding those archetypes come from, I think, life experiences and finding things uh, that you see in the world. You don't have to experience them yourself. You can just observe them. You know, a lot of the things that I that I put in my thing in my films are I observe something and I'll keep it kind of locked away, and I'm just looking for a place to to use that uh, in a film. I've had several scripts that have kind of danced around this issue of how far would you go to protect your child, and then in Killing Time, I took that kind of universal thought or that the life experience of how much sacrifice you'll make for your own child to the point of, would you kill yourself to protect your child, right? Like taking it to that. So again, it's, a, it's I think anybody who's a parent who has a child would recognize, you know, those feelings and of getting then a unique, interesting way of presenting it in that movie. Um, and so that's where I, you know, uh, and I see, I, I steal stuff from, I see what my kids do 
from what I see Krista doing, my coworkers, no one's safe. If you're near me, you're not safe. I will steal what happened to you and I will put it in a film. I'll just change the names. Yeah, and I think one of the things that we both really agree on that um, we always start with a character, uh, something, you know, a character who's interested, a person. It's always, stories are always about a person, right? And so I had someone once asked me about like, oh, what about themes? And I was like, the theme is never, it's never something in the writing stage that you ever focus on. Otherwise you end up with this very preachy, I think very false sounding, you know, like it just like, it doesn't hit you as authentic. Um, I always focus on the characters first, like interesting people in interesting situations. The themes will come out of whatever choices those, those people make, but it's always about in reality, what choice would this person make? And um, so for me, it's always about telling interesting people, or in some cases, it's not people, it's aliens or, or it's, um, yeah. <laughs> and you know, pets, I don't know, there are all kinds of stories, but you know, there's always some main um, character that we're focused on and, and that person or animal being in an interesting situation and how they, how they respond. Yeah, I mean, when I wrote Quiet Mom's Working to bring it all the way back, to the film we're discussing. Um, I, I did not know the truth of what mom's doing in the basement when I started writing it. I just knew, I knew the characters and I knew what was going to happen, kind of like the interruptions. And I had a sense of where the first, I knew where, where I knew where act two was going to start or the second episode, so to speak. But I didn't know how it ended um, until I got there. And that's when I discovered the characters just led me to that obvious ending, which I think will, which is, I think the most satisfying endings are when you're totally surprised and then you go, you look back and you go, but it's obvious that that was the ending. Like that was, that has to, that that's the only ending that can be, but I was still totally surprised. And hopefully that worked. That's what I was going for. And oftentimes you, the best way to find that is to not predetermine. And I think a lot of uh, filmmakers and writers get in trouble of, they, they, they pick a beginning and an ending and then they have to shoehorn the rest of the script to get to the ending that they've already determined. And that ending is not true to the characters. You see that in huge blockbuster movies all the time where you, you, you go, why did the characters do that? And the only answer is because, because they had to get to that ending. <laughs> that's all. That's the only reason they did it. So I think better films let the characters dictate what the story is. And then you have a very satisfying ending to that story. Okay. Hey, this has been fun talking with you. I know I could go on, but we've been going for just about 45 minutes right now. So what I always do is give a chance to you guys now to say, is there any final words you'd like to say about this film or anything else that you've got going on? Well, about this film, just see it. I, you know, we will uh, keep people updated. We have a website. Um, John Hogg Danger is our production company. So jhdanger.com is our website. And we'll keep people updated. Um, as we get into film festivals, we'll let you know what the schedule is. Uh, I don't know, Patrick, if you want to share any social media that you might post the, when it's going to be up. Sure, I'll probably I'll be posting stuff on uh, on uh, Instagram slash Threads, which is now one whole thing. It's I'm at P Patrick Hogan at P Patrick Hogan. No periods or anything. Um, so if you want to know about what we got going on, go there. And just you know, if you're into filmmaking, support independent filmmaking, support film festivals. Um, yes, you have to go to the big blockbusters and the big movies and the theaters, but it's also great to spend a little of that money on the independent scene because most of the really cool stuff that you'll see a couple of years later on the big screen and the big budget start, you know, at the, at the lower level. There's a lot of big filmmakers right now who are working on uh, big budget stuff for television and film who you would have known about years and years ago if you've been going to some of the really cool festivals, uh, especially the genre festivals. There's so many imaginative, cool films that you know push boundaries good and bad that you won't ever get to see in in a project that has to be greenlit by you know a hundred different people 
And so it's always fun to go uh, support uh, independent filmmaking. And the best way to do that is to attend uh, festivals, pick some good festivals, and I think you'll uh, enjoy it a lot. Thank you very much for joining me. And uh, for everybody watching, the, again, we were having a nice discussion with Patrick Hogan and Anna Kirsta Johnson uh, about their film, uh, Quiet, Mom is Working. And actually, a large body of work that you guys both have out there is pretty amazing. So again, if you like what these interviews are doing, please like, subscribe, share that sort of stuff on the channel so that we can do more and more. And just so you know, I will be writing up a review of Quiet Moms Working. This will be linked to that review back and forth so that everything will be available. And if you want to, like they're saying, it was uh, joghawkdanger.com and on Instagram, P. Patrick Hogan. And I'll have those in the notes along with this. So thank you very much. And I go, I have to say good luck in January. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. It was fun being on. Talking and thanks for having us on. Yeah. Thank you.